Well, thank you very much. And I, I say with a special degree of feeling at the moment that it is a real pleasure to be here. <laughs> uh, Rigia, thank you for that exceptionally kind introduction. Uh, though I do have to say that this uh, characterization of world famous economist is a distinctly mixed blessing. Uh, <laughs> world famous is okay, but the other part, given the general reputation of the profession, on, on the other hand, uh, to be described as Warrigi Bowman's mentor uh, gives me a great thrill. Uh, it's just a, tr uh, a treat to, uh, to be back here, to be here uh, uh, in the company of one of my most uh, creative and um, accomplished students. Thank you. It's also a pleasure to be here at the Clinton School, a sister institution. I'll resist the temptation to say a little sister institution. <laughs> uh, but in the great spirit of presidential schools of public affairs, public policy, public service. I would also uh, like to just say a word about the uh, uh, great kindness that President Clinton uh, showed um, to my father, um, whom he awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom uh, in August of uh, 2000, um, and uh, to whom he paid a personal visit, actually, in the last year of my father's life when he was about 96 years old, um, something all of us in, in our family uh, greatly appreciated, it's not least of all my father himself. I also should note that my brother served uh, for five years in the Clinton administration as the ambassador, the first United States ambassador uh, to Croatia at a very difficult moment uh, through several wars and the uh, eventual achievement of peace uh, in the Balkans. <clears throat> I did not work in the Clinton administration, although I did have an association with President Clinton that goes back to, <clears throat> I hesitate to say this, it goes back to 1971, uh, when um, I worked as the deputy national student organizer uh, for McGovern for president. Uh, in the same office where Bill Clinton was the southern regional desk man. <laughs> we did not meet that I recall. I, I was aware of his presence, but we didn't meet. Uh, after all, I was working on something that was actually important <laughs> to the success of that campaign. <laughs> but let me stop reminiscing and, and turn to my theme, which uh, is the years ahead under okay, I won't mince words, under President Obama, following what I expect as a faithful reader of Nate Silver uh, will be his reelection uh, tomorrow. Okay, perhaps I should knock on wood, not uh, tempt fate with such a, a pre-election statement, but what I want to do is to presume uh, that that will happen uh, and talk a little bit about what comes next. And particularly given the strong role that President Clinton has played in this campaign, I think it's useful to do this. Um, because <clears throat> the Clinton factor um, imparts a certain flavor to the economic discourse. It was, after all, a, a notably happy and successful period, the Clinton administration, in American economic life, uh, one that had a widespread feeling of prosperity about it. And I suspect that in the next administration, presuming that it is a continuation of the Obama administration, there will be a strong argument to place the same bundle of policies into place uh, that we saw in the mid to late 
1990s, and that are widely felt to be responsible for the prosperity of that period. What were those policies? Fiscal restraint, right? which began in 1993 with the, with the Clinton tax program. Uh, monetary ease, which of course we already have. Um, Market-friendly regulation. It will begin, I suspect, with a push to avoid what is described in alarmist beltway circles as that looming fiscal cliff that the Congress uh, set up for itself um, in the, uh, over the last year. And it will aim at measures to trim Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, perhaps not immediately, but in the long run. And why those programs? Because they are programs which are susceptible to being legislated now with effects that will be projected out over long time horizons, something that's not true, for example, of the military budget or discretionary expenditure. So inexorably, the pressure to recreate the atmosphere of the 1990s, if it comes and takes that form, <clears throat> will take the form of cutting back the protections that those programs especially presently provide. Now there's, an, I think, a background premise to this um, uh, line of thought, which is that the great financial crisis of four years ago was a one-off event, a once uh, in a great while cataclysm, a hundred year flood, a black swan, uh, <clears throat> basically a panic in other words, as the result of specific policies or events or circumstances that were essentially in place only for a short period of time before that. Uh, and that was effectively ended by the successful intervention of the government through the TARP program, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, through the uh, various programs, the, uh, uh, the TALF and the other uh, interventions, uh, emergency actions of the Federal Reserve, through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, the stimulus bill, um, and perhaps something <coughs> whose repetition we are protected against by, let's say, the Dodd-Frank bill and other steps that have been taken uh, in the last few years uh, to uh, ostensibly, anyway, address the difficulties of the financial sector. But anyway, the thought is, well, it's four years past. Uh, it hasn't happened again, and therefore maybe it won't, which is, I suppose, a little bit the way people felt about uh, a repetition of Katrina until last week. The economy on this line of thinking is due for recovery. Great recessions are followed by recoveries. In fact, part of the function of adopting that terminology, <laughs> describing the sequence of events that we've been through is a great, as a great recession, is to suggest in the back of your mind that a recovery must necessarily follow. Otherwise, we choose a different word to describe this experience that we've been having. And if a recovery is due, maybe it's even already underway. An attitude which, of course, the present administration, the president, understandably, as part of his election campaign, has been uh, attempting to encourage. So the political force of that argument will, I think, be deepened uh, if, as I expect, the national electorate also basically defeats Governor Romney and thereby implicitly rejects the pessimistic message that he's been offering. I mean, it seems to me reasonable that, I mean, the, go the governor has been saying well, things are not going well, uh, that we are way behind the track that we should be on. Uh, and uh, if in spite of that message, the electorate gives President Obama another four years, uh, there will be a general tendency to conclude uh, that Governor Romney was wrong in what he's saying. The voters reject a message, well, perhaps it must be false. And the unfortunate fact is that this is, of course, not necessarily so. 
it's not necessarily a sound way to think about the, uh, the issues. Let me um, take a step back in time and suggest that when we examine the sweep of economic history since the Second World War, when a really thorough, comprehensive history of this is written, or perhaps just a compelling essay on uh, what we've been through in our lifetimes, I think what we'll eventually see is that the turning point was not 2007. It was rather 1970. There, there was a major change in our basic circumstances 42 years ago now. And that change created conditions with which we've been trying to cope ever since. Before 1970 and from the 1930s, but especially the post-war period, 1945, our major source of energy, anyway, of liquid fuel, oil, was domestic and it was cheap. And the price was controlled a few hundred miles south of here in the town I now live in, in Austin, Texas, by the Texas Railroad Commission. Uh, the U.S. was the dominant manufacturing power in the world, something which emerged out of the Second World War, but was basically still th true for another quarter century. And as a result of that, we operated in an environment basically of balanced trade, some deficits, some surpluses but essentially balanced up through 1970. We had a, an international monetary system created by us and the British, by Harry Dexter White and John Maynard Keynes at Bretton Woods in 1945. The conference was in 1944, um, <clears throat> um, which was tailor-made to a world in which the United States was the central player. In other words, we were institutionalized at the center of that system because while every other country converted, while we converted our dollar to gold, every other country converted their currency to dollars. Okay. Um, and our large corporations ruled the roost in a global sense. They were the most extensive economic entities on the planet our large manufacturing, industrial, and technical corporations, from General Motors to international business machines. And none of that is true any longer. We, in 1970, saw the peak of the production of conventional domestic oil. We saw, in 71, the collapse of that Bretton Woods monetary system. We saw the oil shocks the loss of control over that crucial resource price. And when then we saw the rise of, inevitable, inevitably, uh, the rise of other industrial competitors, Europe, Japan, and later on Mexico and Korea, and then finally, of course, China, beginning really with the start of the open door policy in 1979, but not really taking, uh, make, making a major impact on us until the early 1990s. I think we have adopted a habit of not thinking about the fundamental character of these changes. Because from 1980 through 2000, 1981 really, from the start of the Reagan administration to the end of the Clinton administration, uh, we, these challenges were kept at bay. And we were able to reproduce for ourselves the idea that that growth moment from 45 to 70 could continue. And it did continue, in a sense, for another 20 years. And there were a variety of devices that we used uh, to achieve this effect, plus the consequences of developments in the wider world, which were once for all, but were massively favorable to us. Uh, what were they? First of all, the high interest rates that began to be imposed in 1979, especially in 1981, right, which were brutal to the American manufacturing sector, 
were also a weapon that we used internationally against the price that we no longer controlled, namely the price of oil. And that price came back down in 1986 in consequence of a long period of weak demand in the developing world because of the debt crisis, in consequence of the pressure of those financial pressures on commodity prices generally. Then in the late 1980s, there came, of course, the collapse of the USSR, which opened up to the world vast new resources of steel, oil, natural gas, nickel, as the Russian industrial base, the Soviet industrial base imploded, and those resources came onto the world market. And then later on, of course, again, the rise of China, which provided the whole world with a vast supply of very low cost consumer goods, including us, including, I suspect, practically every one of us, wearing something made by a worker in southern China and sold in this country at a very low price. All of these things meant that inflation basically disappeared for a 30-year period. And there was, at the same time, the rise of the dollar, no longer mediated by the Bretton Woods institutions, but now as the sole source of, let's say, protection against financial instability. Financial instability which spread all across the world. And you had a crisis in Russia in 19, uh, a crisis in Asia in 1997 and in Russia in 1998, a whole sequence of financial crises which redounded to our benefit because to protect themselves and stabilize things, other countries decided they needed to hold US Treasury bonds and bills to take the, keep the dollar in a reserve asset position. And that also helped bring investment flows to this country in this period, in the late 1990s, to support what was a very caref carefully fostered uh, information technology boom. Something that the Clinton and Gore administration did very carefully and uh, energetically from their beginning. I mean, it's been probably a week didn't go by where there wasn't a speech about the future importance of the internet, all of which created a climate of expectation that by the end of the decade was causing an enormous amount of funds to flow to the uh, venture capital enterprises of that period. And I'm not saying that Al Gore invented this. I'm just saying <laughs> that the administration knew what it was doing as it s sought to foster and develop the sector of the economy. Right? And of course, the private sector did its part, and the whole result was a very strong increase in private business investment in the late 1990s. Actually rose by the peak by about 2% of GDP relative to what it normally is. And the result of that was a very prosperous period. Unemployment rate, the unemployment fell below 4% and stayed below 4% for four years, up until 2000. Um, and there was no inflation to speak of as a result, in part because of the changes that I've just described that were happening outside the country. There was an enormous increase, by the way, in this period in recorded income inequality. And to this day, I believe, at least according to some, some measures, and measures that I tend to use, um, the peak of income inequality as reported in tax records is actually in 2000, the last uh, period of the Clinton administration. Right. Uh, why is that? Because of the enormous accretion of stock options, realizations, and capital gains, and flows of income out of venture capital into Silicon Valley and King County, Washington, Seattle, Bill Gates, Microsoft at that time. In fact, if you take out Wall Street, Manhattan, and three counties in Northern California, San Francisco, San Mateo, and Santa Clara, and King County, Washington, then the measure of inequality between counties only rises about half as much as it actually did 
you know, tiny places, really, in the great scheme of things in the country. We're responsible for an enormous amount of that uh, uh, extra income. But the high inequality coexisted with very widespread prosperity. As I said before, low unemployment, but also high wages, rapidly declining poverty rates in all of American communities, including minority communities. So that by the end of this period, actually, African American poverty was at an all time low. So these two things actually went side by side, which is not exactly the Marxist story, right? But it's, uh, it is, in some sense, the American story. But then it came to an end. I have to say that in the late years of the Clinton administration, some of the seeds of later disaster were planted. I don't think we can deny that. In the actions taken to deregulate and desupervise, especially to deregulate in this period, desupervision came under Bush, uh, the uh, financial sector. Decisions which would contribute materially to catastrophe a few years later. There was the repeal of Glass-Steagall, separation of commercial and investment banks in 1999. And then in December of 2000, there was the infamous Commodity Futures Modernization Act slipped in, 186 pages or so slipped into a 12,000 page bill in December after Gore v. Bush actually had been resolved, <coughs> which deregulated credit default swaps and said in fact that they couldn't be regulated at all creating and fostering a vast market in uh, what is basically naked speculation uh, in financial assets. <clears throat> then also, after 2000, the technology bust ended what you might call the most creative phase of that particular revolution. As I say, there was a moment when it was creating a lot of jobs, fostering a lot of investment. And afterwards, the technologies were more or less in place. Some things were still being added, but it wasn't the kind of mad gold rush that had was there before. But the technologies were being spread through the economy. And the effect of that is not necessarily to stimulate activity. It can be to depress it. I'll come back to that momentarily. The Bush administration got us into a, well, I won't say got us into the war in Afghanistan, and we all know how that happened, but it did get us into the war in Iraq, which um, illustrated, I think, for everybody, the objective limits in the modern world of military power. Just how little, in fact, you can do with it. I think anybody who's in professionally involved in that endeavor came to appreciate that. Um, cannot achieve political goals, cannot control the world resource flows, and it does not support economic activity at home because the, the wars that you can actually fight are never big enough to do that. We will never go back to the kind of mo full mobilization that we had in 1939 to 1942. And then <clears throat> the last thing that was supporting the semblance of economic growth in our society was housing finance. It was real estate. It was what the banks were doing with the mortgages that were being generated by mortgage originators like Countrywide and AmeriQuest and IndyMac and Washington Mutual. Right? Which was doing two things. It was building a certain number of houses Houses that in some cases would never be lived in, in subdivisions in Florida and Southern California because the people who bought those houses were, didn't have enough money to move in. And it was also very substantially pushing loans on people who could never afford to repay them and who would only touch a fraction of their ultimate indebtedness 
low-income homeowners in places like Cleveland who needed home repairs or a medical bill who might get a loan for 5000 have it refinanced a half a dozen times and end up owning, owing 20 or 25 right? and being foreclosed and thrown out of a home that was not, in fact, repaired. Lots of this went on. But the effect in the short run was, of course, to generate both activity and massive profits in the financial sector. Profits on the origination, profits on the securitization of these loans. You could see, you could tell that something very bad was happening. If you just thought for a moment about the state of housing in America, FDR in the 1930s said one third of a nation, ill fed, ill clothed, ill housed. This was not true in the 1990s. We were a middle class home owning nation. Right? We had had successful institutions to buy, create a secondary market for mortgages that had worked pretty well for decades, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, right? and Ginnie Mae too. And that market was mature. If you qualified for a mortgage for a prime loan, chances are you could get one. Well, a mature market isn't going to grow rapidly, and it isn't going to be the basis for a very large part of economic growth in general. That's the nature of mature markets. Right? It's new markets that grow rapidly. So if the market for good loans for, was uh, saturated, what could you do? You needed another market. And there was another market that was not saturated. Right? This was the market for bad loans. Mathematical proposition holds that there is no limit to the amount of money you can lend if you do not expect to get repaid. <laughs> huh? And this mathematical proposition was discovered by all of the quantitative geniuses who took over Wall Street in this period. A few years ago, okay, I'll, I'll digress for a second here, um, since I've got your attention, and tell you that I went to Italy uh, for a small meeting in a beautiful place in Umbria, uh, sponsored by the Gorbachev Foundation. And it was just 12 or so Russians, mostly members of the Academy of Sciences, one Italian, and me. Uh, and I had the chance to give a, pre a paper at a small table with President Gorbachev at the head of the table. So I turned to him and I said, Mr. President, when Homer returns to write the story of our era, he will say, that the Russian mathematician swept out of Muscovy in 1991 and presented themselves before the gates of Wall Street bearing the gift of quantitative risk management models. <laughs> that they were received with joy and they set to work and in less than 20 years they had destroyed the whole place. <laughs> I'll say, I said, you know, Mr. President, this was clearly the greatest Trojan horse operation since Troy. <laughs> and um, in history, you will be credited not only with the end of Soviet communism, but also with the demise of financial capitalism. <laughs> he said, I've been accused of worse. <laughs> Any event, the financial sector destroyed itself. In what was, and I don't wish to mince words here, in what was, in a technical sense, a vast wave of crime and fraud. It was the savings and loan debacle reproduced and elaborated on on an epic scale, with the victims being anybody who invested in the securities and many people who were trapped in mortgages that they couldn't pay and houses that they were destined to lose. And when this became clear, which it did actually on a day in August 2007, the whole rotten structure collapsed and fell in. And that's a fact that we're living with now. So where are we? I think actually to give him credit, and I think this was perhaps the most effective line of attack of his campaign that Governor Romney was right. 
in saying that we are far below where we expect to be in terms of economic growth and jobs. Where he's not right in saying that there's some magic formula to repair this damage or they just replace the leader and then by some hocus pocus the underlying problems will disappear. And the underlying problems, it seemed to me, have, I mean, we have to face three major ones. First, I'll come back to resource costs, specifically the price of oil, but resource costs in general, because lots of resources depend upon the cost of energy. And it's not just a question of physical scarcity, but a question of who controls the price and how volatile it is and how subject to influence by the financial markets, by speculators, by commodity index investors and so forth. And we have two things. The fact that those costs are about double what they were in the 1990s. So what economists call the terms of trade have fallen by a lot. And secondly, they're a lot more uncertain. And the high price, particularly in an importing country such as ourselves, is a direct deduction from business profits. It takes away, it's, it's company costs is what it is, and it takes away from their bottom line. So it reduces the rate of profit that American businesses can earn. And the uncertainty, of course, is a charge on future expected profits and therefore on your willingness to invest. It induces caution. And with less investment, you get less employment, less profitability, less growth. And that's true on both sides of the energy equation. It's true for the people who consume it, for whom energy is a cost, and it's true for the people who produce it, who have to face the possibility that the price that they're getting now, which might be pretty good, won't be so good in six months. I think that's less of a factor there because energy producers tend to you know, be accustomed to those kinds of risks. But it is nevertheless quite different from an environment where you expect to have a solid margin over your costs for the indifferent future. Will we be rescued by natural gas? Uh, don't ask me, I'm not an expert on this. I just throw that out as a question. I acknowledge that that issue is there, and maybe we will be. But the effect of that will not be felt so long as we're not absolutely confident that we'll be rescued by natural gas. It may sneak up on us at some point, or it may not. Second big issue, it seems to me, that we face is, is this consequence of the technological change that we are, have been living through. Schumpeter, long ago, the Austrian economist who came to Harvard in, in the 30s, co coined this phrase, gales of creative destruction. And what he meant was that technology has a creative impact but also a destructive impact. And I think when you see the sequence of this, you see the creation comes first and the destruction comes later. And the technologies, information and communications technologies, which make it easy to outsource things, easy to automate things, easy to dispense with uh, office work in particular, are doing to office workers essentially what the internal combustion engine did to the horse. Right? <coughs> they are rendering them substantially redundant and making it possible for businesses to cut costs going forward by figuring out new ways to employ the technology. And of course the technologies are creeping into every new niche, every niche they can, they can occupy. As any journalist, any newspaper person will surely tell you if there are any newspaper people left. <clears throat> right? Right? So it's a problem. And it's a problem which is going to show up in much greater difficulty for workers of a certain age to find new jobs that they'll accept. And we'll see that. We are seeing that. It's a question we have to deal with. Um, and the third thing, to come back to what I was just saying, is the uh, dysfunction, the heavy fixed cost imposed on us all by the financial sector. The economy dominated by a handful of large banks that do what exactly? Borrow from the central bank at zero, lend back to the government at 3%? I mean, it's great work. Get a bank charter. Requires no risk judgment at all, no underwriting at all. It does not support commercial and industrial activity. Uh, and of course, nobody's going to borrow or lend in the home sector, in the housing sector, so long as 
30% of American families are underwater, upside down on their mortgages. Not going to happen on a substantial scale. So we've got a big problem of institutions which were created and did something once, maybe, but aren't doing it now and aren't likely to do it again. And then I think in the uh, post-election period, we are going to run a significant, worse, uh, a significant risk of making things worse. <clears throat> there is going to be a wave of deficit and debt hysteria pushing us down the road that European countries have been taking for some time of thinking that somehow the problem is the national debt and that the solution is spending cuts, tax increases that will somehow reduce a computer projection of what the debt will be but never have an effect on the debt itself. There is a complete illogic here in terms of understanding or failure to understand what the position of the United States in the world economy is. We have a very strong position. It's obvious from the fact that in the crisis, although the crisis originated in American financial institutions, the financial <coughs> entity that was affected least was the government of the United States, a fact you can observe by picking up the paper and looking at the long-term interest rate. Interest rates went up in Greece and Spain and Portugal and Ireland and Italy. They went down in the United States as they did in Britain and Germany. Right? People fled the weak assets, bought the strong. And so long as we are the reserve, source of reserve currency in the world, the source of reserve financial assets, we have to run a budget deficit. So we have to supply public bonds for the Bank of China, the Bank of Japan, the Reserve Bank of India, uh, anybody else who wants to hold them. We can't do anything about it. Try not to do it, they'll just bid up the price of the dollar, which will reduce our, import, our exports and uh, and, and, and our tax uh, uh, take, and therefore we'll get the budget deficit again. That's just a fact of the way the world works when you are not a currency, uh, when you have, when you're the currency provider essentially, or the financial asset provider to the world. We've been doing this, by the way, for almost 40 years, and it might be useful for official Washington to take note of it, right? It's like not understanding that there are nuclear weapons in the world or something. A similar misunderstanding affects the way we think about social insurance, about Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, which I keep coming back to, not least because I suspect a sympathetic audience, <laughs> right? Uh, but especially because we need to understand that these programs are most efficient when they're universal. When you cut them back, you raise the cost. And one of the reasons their enemies want to cut them back is precisely because they can't stand the comparison between the public and private insurance functions. But let's face it, there are lots of things the private sector does very well, but providing social insurance isn't one of them. Every other country has figured this out. So what should we do? I'll just be very brief because I know I've already kept you. First of all, I started late and I've kept you longer than you anticipated. I think the important thing, first of all, is to protect the institutions we have. I am not someone who says, well, you know, we should all uh, go over and study Sweden and bring it back here. No. The strength of the institutions we have is our first important asset and underappreciated. And that includes the ones I've just mentioned, but it also includes the way we fund public education and has included the way we fund sensible housing programs. Lots of things about this country are actually quite functional which is why we have not fallen into a desperate near state of collapse in the way that, let's say, Greece or Spain have. And if, you, if you've been to Greece lately, I think you know exactly what I'm saying. It's a very tense situation bordering on the kinds of violence that we would consider almost unimaginable here. Um, I think we can do useful things with our working population. I would raise the minimum wage. I would raise it by a lot, actually. That's a, that's a step which would increase federal tax revenue, so it's not a budget buster, on the contrary. And it would provide low-income workers with, enough, with more income. Right? It might cost a few jobs, maybe not. But I will tell you that they did this in Britain. 
and it's become totally uncontroversial. They had no minimum wage. It's now much higher than ours. And nobody, not even the Tories, argues that it cost jobs. It just didn't. It changed the structure of the labor force for sure, but actually proved to be a very good thing. Small businesses made it back through the front door what they were paying out in their, in their payroll. People talk about retirement age. And admittedly, you were all in robust good health and surely could squeeze a few extra years of work uh, out of yourselves. But does this make sense in a world where we've lost 8 million jobs, many of them lost by older workers, who are applying for unemployment insurance because they need to qualify for it, not because they think they're going to find a job because they aren't? Why not do what every sensible university does when you get a doddering elderly professor <laughs> who needs to be encouraged to leave the classroom, right? You give them a few extra years on their retirement program. You could do that with Social Security. You could do it tomorrow. Let's say, let's say for three years, you reduce the uh, eligible age for the, for the early benefit to 59, and you say it, if you leave at 62, you get the full benefit or something close. And then a lot of people who are in this transition period, my age, <coughs> but actually working for a living, uh, would, would jump at that. And their jobs would be open to younger people who need them more. And both parts of the population would be happier. I can't think of anything that would be sort of faster acting or more commonsensical than something like that. But you have to start thinking about what these programs are actually good for and not thinking about them as though they were businesses, which they are not. I think that we do need to restructure, downsize, control the banks. I would, take, I would have taken over the failed banks in 2009 so would have a number of senior officials who were in power at that time, um, notably the chairperson of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, who is a pretty good authority on these matters. Um, but it's not too late. <laughs> really, we don't need them all. Banks are taking, the big banks are taking 10% of payroll, 40% of profits at the peak. This is grossly excessive. Nothing that they do requires that kind of resources, and that, again, is a deduction from everybody else's profitability. I would simply start thinking about what kind of financial sector we need and start building it in the next few years. And then finally, of course, there is this vast problem of energy and climate change, which I hope the great taboo of talking about it and seeing its importance will have been broken uh, maybe the one thing that we may gain from this atrocious experience that the city of New York and the Jersey Coast have just, experienced, just gone through. It's just very hard to deny that this is a, this extraordinary event. It has a lot to do with the fact that the oceans are warmer than they used to be. Huh? I would finally not expect miracles. I think it's very important to understand the difficulty of the situation. I titled my talk, The Grim Present and the Bleak Future. <laughs> right, that's a good economist's talk, actually. Right? <laughs> but if we could start making movement in the right direction, that would be a miracle enough. Thanks very much. We do have time for a couple quick questions, and then I know we'll get you out of here, and then um, raise your hand, and we'll get a microphone to you. It's going to be a quite an expensive question. Um, oh, boy. Those specific policies uh, that somehow you were saying were seeded in, uh, in the end of the Clinton administration, um, somehow leading into Bush and Obama, those policies, specific policies, do you think it'll be conducive for the president to overturn them? Although I see that he's, been, he's made some modifications to the Bush policies, but um, 
there have been some modifications in the Bush policies, but mm -hmm. the overturning, why is it President Obama so impetuous in terms of social policies being overturned rather than the fiscal policies or the economic policies he's somehow uh, accepting or just being modified rather than overturned? Well, I, the question, let me just frame the question as, as should we go back to Glass-Steagall? Should we repeal the, the uh, or should we ban the credit default swaps? Um, I don't have an easy answer to either of those questions. Uh, there is a certain problem associated with, with inventing ways around the regulations. Uh, having invented them, including ways that involve going outside the jurisdiction of the United States uh, to make these contracts in other places, it is not entirely clear to me, as a former legislative drafts person, how you go about writing a law that puts those things back in place. In 1933, you know, you were talking about national banks that work, did their work in New York on paper. Well, it's, the world's changed a little bit. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of titling the chapter of the manuscript I'm working on that deals with this, the problem that can't be solved. I don't know. What do you do with, what is a credit default swap? It's basically 30 or 60 pages of legal boilerplate into which you add a few lines describing which specific transaction you're betting on. Are we going to say that pieces of paper that describe bets are per se illegal? Wow. How do you enforce that? And how do you enforce it if the bets are made in, I don't know, Singapore by subsidy? I don't know exactly how you go about dealing with this. It is, however, a huge problem, and not just for us. Let me, let me just talk about how it affects the Europeans. And I spent a lot of time in Europe recently on the, these issues. And the European the official attitude is to say, well, we have a Greek crisis, and a Spanish crisis, and a Portuguese crisis, and so forth. And each country has its own special problems. The Greeks have got uh, you know, bad public administration. Not a surprise, by the way. This is not a state secret wasn't a state secret even 10 years ago or 30 years ago. Uh, the Spaniards had a housing boom. This was actually known, you know, to people making loans for this. Um, but that's not the point. The point is that the bonds of all of these countries are in big pools uh, where they can be bet against both directly by selling them short or indirectly by buying a CDS on them. And it can happen in New York, it can happen in London, it can happen anywhere. And no matter how many reforms poor Mr. Samaras, uh, Mr. Rajoy in Spain implement, how many cuts, how many pensions they revoke and everything else, something bad happens in the world, the investment community is going to sell their stuff and buy ours. They can't get out of it this way. And so there's a real, until the Europeans figure out how to fund the central public activities and to monitor in an appropriate way how the funds are spent, it's not a problem they're going to get a grip on. Bob, right here. Right here. It's coming. Thank you. Earlier you mentioned regulation as a form of driving public policy. I was wondering if you had an opinion on the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I mean, I, of course, I, I, I think the, this is one of the bright spots of the Obama administration, and I know some very energetic and dedicated people who have gone there. Um, the, of course, I great, greatly admire Elizabeth Warren, and I greatly admire the fellow who, whose name now escapes me, who's the, who's, who, who eventually became the director of it. I'll reserve further judgment until I see what they do about payday loans, for example. Um, there is a difficulty here, though, which is the difficulty of uh, locking the barn door after the horses have gone. Uh, are we going to see a revival of, um, let's say, securitized 327 or 228 mortgages, which were strictly there to force people to refinance and refinance, a purely abusive instrument. Uh, Sheila Baer, by the way, uh, has a book called Bull by the Horns, which I highly recommend, which 
and which makes this point. This, these, these loans were, were given to people where the teaser rates were not low. They were 7, 9 percent. They were at the, at the limit of what these people could afford. And the resets were not designed ever to be paid. They were designed to force a refinancing and then another set of fees. But th still, the investors deluded themselves into thinking they would get paid and wouldn't accept a systematic modification. Just a complete, uh, well, I can think of a word for it, but it's not a word I would use here. Uh, the, um, so rulemaking on this might be useful, but it's, it, 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 we have to be careful about making laws which are uh, basically applied to markets that have already collapsed and that will not return under any circumstances. I'm happy to have those laws in place. I just don't expect them to have much effect on the world. Last one, right there. I know you're not a healthcare economist, but do you have any particular insights on how to control Medicare costs? Um, oh, no, you're right. I'm not a healthcare economist, uh, so my my insight is derivative and based upon what smart people tell me, including actually in one case a former student who went to work in OMB in the Bush administration when Medicare Part D came in. Um, and what one hears is really is no substitute for having guidance and guidelines on prices. You just have to have, that's what everybody else does, it has a functional system. You have some limits on what people can be charged for given procedures and given, um, for, and given pharmaceuticals. And people live with it. Uh, there is at least one thing that I was told was that actually in the Bush administration, they knew that Medicare Part D had the risk of being a complete blow up, which actually didn't prove to be the case. Right? Uh, what did they do? Well, they had an OMB director who was a drug guy. And they basically reached a kind of backdoor understanding with the companies. I don't know if this is, I, I couldn't document this. But somebody told me this who was credible. Uh, and so the system actually functioned um, because our Republican administration behaved like a sensible administration but just didn't admit to it. Um, <clears throat> was that the, if that was the last question, I'll close with a story, right? Because as perhaps some of you who are really of rich years may know. Um, my father was a price controller. He was, in fact, the deputy director for prices of the Office of Price Administration from shortly after Pearl Harbor until May of 1943, which made him, after, after the German Fuhrer, one of the least popular people in the country. <laughs> I, I, I asked him once, how he found 17,000 people in a few months to uh, help control prices. And he said, land grant colleges. And I said, what? He said, there were a lot of economics departments, young professors who were too old to fight, wanted to do something. I just hired them all. <laughs> it, was, it was absolutely the last time the economics profession was actually useful for something. <laughs> But my father, my father never gave up on the, uh, on the merits of a well-timed price control. And this will be my final comment. When August 15th, 1971, uh, when Richard Nixon announced the freeze on wages and prices, thereby capitulating to the Galbraith view of the world. <laughs> and by the way, Nixon's first job was working in the Office of Price Administration on rubber issues. Um, so there are some letters that are signed J.K. Galbraith drafted by R.M. Nixon. Hmm? Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, to get to the punchline, which I know you know is coming, but to, the Washington Post called my father and said, uh, how do you feel about the action just taken by President Nixon? And he said, I feel like the streetwalker who has just been told that not only is her profession legal, but the highest form of municipal service. <laughs> Thank you all very much.